Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Karen Fagan, PHA Board of Trustees Chair-Elect and PHA Scientific Leadership Council, Immediate Past Chair. Well, uh, I hope everyone's had a great opportunity to get to know people at your table and enjoy your meal. Um, I'm here tonight to fill in for Dr. Todd Bull, who was originally going to be talking about our research program, who couldn't be here. Um, and it's a real privilege for me, because thanks to the thousands of PHA donors, including many of you in this room, who've helped fund our mission, including funding investments in research, we've been able to make great strides. PHA has continued to invest in cutting-edge research and cultivate new leaders in the PH field, many of whom are with us this evening. PHA began providing research grants in 2000 and has six programs that we have been providing research support to. Since the program's exception, inception, the PHA has provided nearly $8 million in research specific to PH. Since the last conference in 2016, nine new awards have been given to researchers in PH, including some of the names that you have seen on the screen. The Proof of Concept Grant Program is a grant that seeks to support new research projects in the early exploratory and developmental stages and have the potential to lead to advances in the scientific understanding of pulmonary hypertension. And you can see this year's winner here. The PHA, th thank you. The PHA ATS Research Fellowship is an award that's co-sponsored by PHA and the American Thoracic Society. And these are designed to enable new faculty level investigators to make the transition to an established investigator. This award began as a partnership with the ATS in 2000. The Aldergetti Research Award for Young Investigators was launched in 2016 and is another award designed to provide new faculty level investigators experience to help them transition into established investigators. The Aldergetti Research Award for Young Investigators is graciously supported by Actilion Pharmaceuticals US, also the sponsor for tonight's dinner. The PHA NHLBI Career Development Awards began in 2003 as a partnership between the PHA and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute as part of the National Institutes of Health. One award is focused on patient-oriented research, and another provides support to researchers through supervised research career development in the fields of biomedical and behavioral research. Our award winner is up there. The Robin J. Barst MD Pediatric PH Research and Mentoring Grant began in 2013. This program is, des mentoring and re is designed to provide mentoring and research opportunities to support and enhance the field of pediatric PH. Thank you. PVD Omics, which stands for Pulmonary Vascular Disease Phenomics Program, is an initiative originated in the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the NIH that is seeking to learn more about how patients with all types of pH differ in their genetics, how the cells use those genes, how your cells use energy, and more. PH joined as the first and only PVD PVD Omics funding partner in 2014, and many of the physicians and scientists in this room are participating in this unique and comprehensive initiative. The 
Just as a note, Dr. Berman Rosenzweig is one of the investigators leading one of the projects in PVD omics. The PHA registry, also known as FAR, P-H-A-R, is a patient registry of new PAH and CTEF patients at participating PH care centers, or PHCCs. To date, more than 600 patients have been enrolled into FAR. Some of you in this room have done that, and we appreciate all of your efforts to be part of FAR. Data from the FAR has already contributed to eight research projects or presentations at the American Thoracic Society and the American College of Chest Physicians. Thank you all for participating. <clears throat> One of the most unique features about this meeting is our research room. Each of you have the opportunity to make an impact in research while you're here at conference these next couple of days. Stop by the research room, which is located in the Coral Ballroom, that way, A and B, on the lobby level tomorrow from 8 to 6 and Sunday from 8 to 10. PH researchers will be collecting data and samples uh, to support their research. And the research room is not just for patients. Some researchers also, researchers also need samples from non-patients, so everyone is welcome and encouraged to stop to, by the research room. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. Please allow me to introduce Dr. Paul Yu. Dr. Yu is an associate physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. In addition to being a practicing cardiologist, Dr. Yu manages research laboratory focused on a better understanding of biologic pathways involved in cardiovascular injury and inflammation and musculoskeletal biology. Dr. Yu attended medical school at Duke University and completed residency at the University of California, San Francisco. He then moved to Massachusetts General Hospital to complete his cardiology fellowship. Importantly, Dr. Yu was the 2006 recipient of the PHA National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute Career Development Award, researching the gene associated with familial pulmonary hypertension, BMPR2. Join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Yu as our speaker for the evening. Dr. Fagan, thanks so much for that really kind introduction. I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for this really kind invitation to speak tonight. It is really a privilege to share some of my thoughts on what the PHA has meant as an organization and a community to us, to our work, and to share with you some of the work that we've done as a result of that support. Just some disclosures. So I wanted to relate a story that goes back to my college days, and it might sort of make you think that some of the things that we experience in life come from fate. Um, this was when I was a pre-med student and did a summer internship at a startup company called Genetics Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And these were the pioneering days of molecular biology and an exciting place with world-class scientists who were taking brand new genes they had just discovered and were trying to translate them into innovative new therapies. Um, the two people that I got to work with were Gordon Wong and John Wozniak. And John Wozniak had done something remarkable just two years before. He had discovered an interesting gene called BMP2, or bone morphogenetic protein 2, and that was named because of its powerful bone-forming effects. And they thought that this might be a helpful treatment for taking care of people with spinal fractures or other fractures in orthopedic surgery. And it turned out to actually be very helpful for that. My project as a summer student was to 
try to identify the missing members of this family, which at the time we really only understood to be BMP2, and its polar opposite, this protein called transforming growth factor beta, or TGF beta. And it was named because it had these powerful effects on tumor cells that were of interest to people studying cancer. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this pathway today, and I'm, I'm not going to try to turn you all into molecular biologists, but I want you to understand this so that maybe um, you'll be prepared for some of the things that I think are happening in pulmonary hypertension as a result of work in this. So this fishing expedition that I had been given for the summer was to take little pieces of this TGF beta gene and use it to fish out other genes that were somewhere in between. They were relatives of one or the other. And this, this has worked many times for other people, but I learned that this was actually a very painstaking process that requires a lot of patience, a lot of discipline, but most of all, a lot of luck. And I wasn't very lucky that summer. Um, I, I didn't succeed in finding any relatives. And during my exit interview with my supervisor, Gordon Wong, he, he revealed to me, yeah, you know, it's really interesting. You're only the third person to work on this in three years without any success. Um, we, we might do something different. So th this is a conversation I wish we had had at the beginning of the summer. But ultimately, other technologies prevailed, and we were able to identify the other members of this pathway, and it suddenly wasn't such a mystery anymore. And there were 33 to be exact. And this is a daunting number because it's, it's very hard when you're thinking about this pathway to know what each one does because they do similar things yet different things. When, when they were discovered, if the scientists were interested in bone formation, they called them BMPs. If they were interested in cancer biology, they would call them transforming growth factors or TGF betas. If they were interested in reproductive biology, sometimes they called them active ins or inhibins. And if they were just developmental biologists interested in how things grow, they would call them growth and differentiation factors. And probably that's the most appropriate name for this whole family, growth and differentiation factors. And at the time, I didn't appreciate how important a role these growth factors would play in my future work, and certainly in the lives of the people that I would care for as a physician. So a decade later, after I finished the summer internship that was not so successful, I had completed medical school and done a PhD in immunology, and I was at UC San Francisco in 1999 when I first worked with Teresa Nermarco, who many of you know is a brilliant PH physician, but also a very inspiring person in general. And I learned a lot working with her on her busy service, and I was fortunate to meet several patients who taught me about pulmonary hypertension and the care of pulmonary hypertension, including Carrie Shellhammer, um, who was then a competitive downhill skier who developed idiopathic PAH during her sophomore year of college, uh, despite being previously in good health. And her rigorous physical training regimen was almost certainly the reason why she was picked up early and treated early, and she did very well for some time. Um, but I was really impressed by how she, like many of you, refused to be held back by this diagnosis. She completed, on time, a rigorous uh, full-time undergraduate program while dealing with the ups and downs of IV flow land therapy, which is why we saw her um, once in a while in the hospital. And I was also struck by why none of us could actually provide an explanation for how she came down with this. The word idiopathic, which many of you know means of unknown cause, was unsettling and seemed to beg the question. So for some patients, there was a family history that suggested a genetic reason, but for Carrie, and for many others, it was unprecedented, and it was puzzling. This isn't a new phenomenon. Scenarios like hers had been described half a century earlier. This was a report from David Dresdale, who is a Brooklyn cardiologist, who was credited with the first understanding of idiopathic or primary pulmonary hypertension. And he used a state-of-the-art technique at the time, right heart catheterization, to put together this, this concept. 50 years later, the same year that Carrie was first diagnosed, a team of investigators carried this concept forward, and this was led by Bill Nichols and Jim Lloyd, investigators who are known to this room, and they made important progress by mapping this trait to a part of chromosome 2. 
This was a landmark discovery that was made possible by people in this room volunteering for the research room at PHA. This progress gave us hope that we would home in. Thank you. And this gave us real progress that we'd home in on the root causes and, and develop better therapies. And it was almost exactly one year after the day that I met Carrie, and I remember this day, that two groups independently reported the identification of the causal gene. And this is BMPR2, and it was responsible, apparently, in the majority of patients with a family history, and even in a sizable fraction of patients who had had no family history. And together we call these heritable PAH. So this, this was a life-changing moment for me because at that point, I, I kind of changed my course. I had actually started residency to become a rheumatologist, but this was when I decided that I wanted to be a cardiologist and, and investigate this further. And I thought, now that we have a gene, it should be pretty straightforward, I thought, to unravel the causes that are downstream of that gene that, that's deficient. But this turned out to be pretty naive. But I think a lot of people felt that it might be straightforward. So after finishing my clinical training and armed with these genetic insights, I started postdoctoral studies at MGH with Kenneth Block and Hiroki Beppu, and we wanted to understand how this mutant gene might affect lung vessels, might change lung development, and might change the way cells grow or divide. And I was really fortunate at that time to receive support from PHA, and this helped me establish the beginnings of an independent research group. And we use the tools of molecular biology to try to deduce the function of BMPR2. The problem is that BMPR2 comes, up, comes with a lot of baggage. It has 12 related proteins in its family that do very similar or overlapping things. And so interpreting what happens when you add or subtract BMPR2 turns out to be a pretty subtle art. But one thing was pretty clear, and this is going to be a theme that I'm going to talk about tonight, is that the signals that come from the right side of this pathway that are downstream of BMPR2 seem to be helpful in preserving the health of the lung circulation. And the signals that come from the left side, from the TGF beta or active inside, they're, they're important signals, but in the context of pulmonary hypertension, they may be more harmful than helpful in some, some cases. So upstream of BMPR2, we thought we might get some clues. But as you know, as I showed you, there are actually 33 ligands. And so the question is, well, how does BMPR2 help us cone down and, and maybe focus on some important players? Unfortunately, almost half of this group of proteins all can interact with BMPR2, so it doesn't really narrow the field. So again, we turn to history to see if we could develop a framework for thinking about pulmonary hypertension and this pathway. So I'm going to go back 50 years again to 1951, and this is the same year that this Brooklyn cardiologist, Dresdale, described idiopathic PAH. Turned out to be a very auspicious year because this person named Turing published a report. And he was not a biologist, he was not a physician, he was a bio, um, a theoretical biologist and a, com and a computer scientist at the time when there really weren't any, any modern computers. In this paper, he described how formulas could describe the diffusion of these theoretical molecules that hadn't been identified yet, that he called morphogens, and they might form gradients in solution that form standing wave patterns that are very complicated. And he, he elaborated this in very sophisticated math that predicted structures that we see in the animal kingdom, like the uh, multiple arms of a, of a hydra, or the world in spiraled patterns of leaves in different plants, and even the formation of embryos themselves. So this is an incredibly bold prediction, just based purely on math and observation of natural phenomena. And it was written by Alan Turing, who many of you might remember is also the father of modern computer science and artificial intelligence, and who gained a lot of notoriety in World War II for solving the constantly changing Enigma cipher during um, during our conflict then, using an electromechanical computer that he designed. And this was recently portrayed by Benjamin Cumberbatch in The Imitation Game. So he was a man of many talents. And he basically predicted this whole field before we had proteins and genes to work with. He showed, and we later, val we, we later um, proved, 
that these morphogens could establish the difference between left and right when forming an animal. These proteins, appropriately called lefty and nodal, help to establish that difference. And also, some of these proteins are important in forming the digits of the hand, that they're important for the patterning of, of these digits. And in general, these BMPs are really important for forming all the branch structures in our body, whether they're the ducts of the salivary gland, they're the airways of the lung, and also the vessels of the lung, the tubules of the kidney, and the mammary ducts. And these are all predicted by his formulas in the standing waves that he described. And it's been validated by modern computational biology using the same, same exact concepts. So how does this help us? Well, I think that informed by this understanding of BMPs as critical patterning molecules, um, we've been interested in understanding how BMPR2 mutations might trigger some of the changes that we see in pulmonary hypertension in the blood vessels there. And many of you know that this includes a whole spectrum that includes these obstructive changes to the lung vessels and these complicated plexiform lesions that almost look like vessel development has gone a little awry. So we're trying to connect the pattern that we see with these pattern-forming molecules and the patterns that we see in pulmonary hypertension. So another thing that's really helped us think about this is the decade of progress that's been made in the genetics of pulmonary hypertension. And after discovering BMPR2 in 2000, several other genes contributing to PAH have been identified, and they affect molecules that are very close in um, location and in function to BMPR2, and they're all on the right side of this pathway. This includes ALK1 and aglin. These are implicated in overlap syndromes like HHT, as many of you uh, might be familiar, and then some of the downstream signaling molecules in the cells. So, when this unfolded over the past decade, it became clear that these mutations all fell on one side of the pathway, the right side affecting BMPs, and probably in a specific cell type, the endothelial cells, whereas we haven't really seen very many disease-causing mutations on the left side of this pathway. So this idea that there might be not enough of signaling on the right side or the BMP side and maybe an unbalance or excess of signaling on the left side has been useful for our thinking. So I, I should mention that these discoveries ultimately helped us to understand Carrie Shellham's disease. Uh, five years after her diagnosis, some of you in the room were involved in helping understand her mutation. She did not have a BMPR2 mutation, it turns out. She had one of these other mutations affecting other genes in this pathway that lead to HHT, but in some people lead to pulmonary hypertension as well as HHT. Uh, we found out that she was an HHT gene carrier, and so were other members of her family, but they were not affected with pulmonary hypertension. And so genetics tells part of the story, but it doesn't explain why not all people with the gene develop the disease. But I think that having this powerful knowledge while it doesn't lead automatically to treatment, I think that it might be a great starting place to start developing treatments. This is Carrie more recently. I can tell you that her disease progressed, as can happen, but fortunately she was able to undergo lung transplantation and has continued to do well since. And this is her and her husband, Zach. Um, they got married after the transplant, celebrating the 10th anniversary of her lung transplant by snowboarding in Tahoe recently. So I want to discuss the ways in which genetics might reveal, in revealing the involvement of the BMP pathway, might help to explain some of the reasons why people get PAH, might help us develop precision medicine approaches to PAH, and ultimately, we hope, lead to better treatments. So one important feature of this you might have noticed is that there is this protein that sits on top of this that's been implicated in these uh, familial cases of pH called BMP9. And it actually is a protein that's known to exist in the circulation and to, based on the research of a French researcher named Sabine Bailey, exert important supportive functions or um, protective functions to the pulmonary circulation. And one of the fellows in my lab working with Jeff Bacobo, who presented on this yesterday, 
Ivana Nikolic asked a simple question. What are the levels of BNP9 in patients with pulmonary hypertension versus people without? We were assisted by many people working in the research room, and I want to thank Greg Elliott for introducing us to the research room several years ago. As a result of your participation in the research room, we were able to get some initial results. So these are data gathered from several hundred of you who've participated, and if you've ever wondered what happens to your blood after you give it, well, it turns into data like this, uh, data that we hope to publish soon. This is from over a series of six PAH meetings where Ivana, Jeff, and other members of our team have enrolled many of you, and we thank you for that. When she first measured these samples for BMP9 levels, <clears throat> what she, and, and this is her actually in the room from 2014, with a look of exasperation, um, she didn't find anything conclusive right away. There, there was quite a lot, of uh, a lot of differences in the levels of BMP9. But when we collaborated with some other folks who had access to patients of less common types of pulmonary hypertension, in this case, people with liver disease, and this was Carrie Roberts at Tufts and Rich Chanick at MGH, we found that BMP9 levels were very diminished in people who had pulmonary hypertension associated with liver disease, but not in the other group one PAH types of disease. So BMP9, we suspected, might be a marker of portal pulmonary hypertension, but we wanted to be sure that this wasn't some nonspecific finding related to liver disease. Working with Ray Chung at MGH, we were able to study a number of patients that had liver disease not associated with pulmonary hypertension, despite being screened by the usual measures like echocardiography and right heart cath. And we found that overall as a group, their levels were not low and especially uh, normal, essentially compared to patients who had had portal pulmonary hypertension. And it was interesting to speculate in the group on the, in the box there that maybe some of these patients who had low levels of BMP9 should be monitored closely. And that's something that we're looking at. We also found that these BMP9 levels might challenge some of our thinking about how we diagnose pulmonary hypertension. First of all, it seemed to create a link between the heritable syndromes of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary hypertension from liver disease that had not been made before. And also, if you looked closely, you might see that there are some folks with low BMP9 levels that were in groups other than portal pulmonary disease and diagnosed as having different types of pulmonary hypertension by their referring physicians. When we looked closely at those folks, we found that there was, in every case, some evidence of abnormal liver function either uh, by liver scans or by blood tests. And so, depending on when this liver function became abnormal, it might make us rethink the diagnosis in some cases. So, we're left wondering if BMP9 might be used to help improve the precision of some of our diagnoses in group 1 PAH, especially with liver disease. The low BMP9 levels in patients with portal pulmonary hypertension supports the concept that the signaling on the left side which we think is protective, might be disrupted and imbalance things towards the right side where TGF-beta pr principally acts. We wanted to know if this was actually driving the process, and so we, we had ways of doing that. One way was to administer a protein that was made from one of the receptors that's responsible for HHT. It's called ALK1, and it soaks up BMP9 and takes it out of circulation. This molecule was given to animals to see if it might precipitate or worsen pulmonary hypertension. And I'll tell you what we saw. We saw that if you gave it to animals who were breathing normal room air, they didn't develop any abnormalities that we could detect by catheterization or by looking at their lung tissues. But if we gave that to animals that had been exposed to hypoxia, it made it dramatically worse. Um, some pressures were uh, higher than what we'd ever seen in the mouse models before. And when we looked at the vessels, there was evidence of obstructive remodeling or loss of patency when we gave the ALK1 trap for BMP9. So this suggests that BMP9 really is a protective factor, and if you remove it, then you, with other injuries, you might be more susceptible to pulmonary hypertension. So in another effort, we wondered if BMP9 is as important as it is, what would happen if you gave extra BMP9 to animals with pulmonary hypertension? 
And it turns out there is an imbalance of this signaling even in animals or people who don't have a known mutation. And so this principle might work for people in general, and this, this is what we tested. We gave the actual BMP9 molecule to animals, and we gave it uh, to four different, in collaboration with Nick Morrell, four different models of pulmonary hypertension. And in the most stringent of these models, this is with what you may have heard of called Sujin hypoxia. This is two different uh, injuries to, to rats uh, where animals can develop pressures that are almost as high as the pressures that you measure in your blood pressure cuff in your arm. Uh, we found that BMP9 could improve pulmonary hypertension even after it had been established, and it could apparently reverse some of the obstruction that happened to those vessels and restore patency or unobstructed flow. So this is very exciting. This was published by Nick's group um, two, two or three years ago, and it's currently in preclinical development, and we're excited about the potential of this. But there are other ways that we can potentially help this pathway uh, for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. And Lai Ming Young, uh, a junior faculty member in our group, asked a different question that is related to this. If we're asserting that TGF-beta is doing something that's um, that's driving disease, would, would absorbing TGF-beta out of circulation with its trap be able to improve pulmonary hypertension? Now, we weren't the first people to ask this question. Other people had done so using other tools, but using this specific trap ensured that we were only treating TGF-beta and not many of the other molecules in this pathway. And so I wasn't quite sure if it would work, but it turns out that he saw a pretty strong effect, and he did this in three different animal models. And again, it reduced pulmonary hypertension even if it was severe and established, and it could restore patency to the pulmonary vessels. And I'm, I'm real happy to say that this is a concept that is being taken seriously and is being um, vetted for potential human trials with animal testing for safety currently. So I've shown you that BMP9 signaling might be helpful, and then TGF-beta inhibition uh, may be helpful. But I haven't addressed all these ligands in the pathway. These are the activins and inhibins and GDF molecules that I told you were discovered by reproductive biologists because they are important in, in reproductive cycling. We hadn't really had clear evidence that these ligands, these proteins, would be doing anything in pulmonary hypertension, so we went in with a fairly open mind. Um, we wondered if these could be neutral. Um, we didn't know if they would be harmful or helpful, but being on the right side of the pathway, you might guess what happened next. Even at the lowest dose, this trap of GDF and activin ligands was able to render pulmonary pressures almost normal in that stringent Sujin hypoxia model, and there was patency that was restored to the pulmonary arteries even at the lowest dose. And this was a finding that we think may have a, a number of explanations. It could be that active and NGDF molecules may be drivers of disease uh, in a way that hasn't been appreciated before. But we also noticed something interesting in some of our studies, which is that when you add this agent to block GDF inactivins, this actor 2 afc and you add it to endothelial cells, you can actually enhance the signaling of BMP9. So there's, there's some complex interplay happening where it's helping to rebalance the signaling in a number of ways, we think. Well, the exciting thing about this molecule is that it's already been in clinical development. It's called Sotatercept, and it's already been tested in 400 patients for safety and also as a potential treatment for anemia, which is a problem that's not actually uncommon in pulmonary hypertension. And so this creates an exciting opportunity to start with a phase two trial, and actually that trial has already begun this past month. The strategies that I've told you about are not the only approaches, and there's some exciting work being done by other people at this conference using the same concept. Um, Dr. Rabinovich presented earlier today her work with Ada Speaker Cotter and Roham Zamanian about using tacrolimus or FK506 to enhance some of the signaling downstream of BMPR2 by inhibiting its inhibitors. Michaela Aldred has talked about a tularen, a 
genetic therapy originally designed for cystic fibrosis to cure some of the mutations that affect people with heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension. And I'll just show you a little bit of that work where Etta showed that tacrolimus could be a benefit in several animal models of pulmonary hypertension. And then in, in a very early stage or phase one clinical trial, she and Raham Zamanian have shown that there's the potential for efficacy and that some of these doses of tacrolimus can increase BMPR2 levels in, in patients who've received this drug. And Etta has shared with me subsequently that she can measure BMPR2 in the circulation, uh, in the circulating cells of people with different types of pulmonary hypertension. And as we would have expected, the, signal, the BMPR2 is diminished in most folks with pulmonary arterial hypertension, but it might be even more diminished in some folks than others, suggesting that they might be stand, they, they might stand to benefit more. And this is Michaela's work on atularin, and she's shown now that atularin can improve the expression of BMPR2, the protein, to almost normal levels when she looked at cells that were taken from people with these premature stop mutations where the BMPR2 is just cut short. Um, and this, this drug allows the protein to be processed and to be made in its full form, and it actually functions and it improves the way that these cells process BMP9. And this is something that would be very specific to just under a third of people with these mutations. So I'm happy to tell you that many of these approaches have a path forward to becoming new therapies. The TGF trapping, the, the BMP9 and the Tularen are in the preclinical stage. Tacrolimus has already shown some safety and potential efficacy of it, uh, signs in the phase one studies. And Pulsar, which is for the study of Sotat receptor after our 2FC, has begun enrolling in the last month. And Pilgrim, which is the study of inhaled Ilopros, specifically in individuals with BMPRT mutations, is currently enrolling. So I hope that what I've shared with you um, has convinced you that I think there is a lot to be gained from studying BMP in relation to the mechanisms of pulmonary hypertension, that it can help us, it can inform our approaches and to help us develop to precision medicine approaches to pulmonary hypertension, and that by actually targeting this pathway, we could achieve better treatments. You heard from Anna Hamneys today, who gave a wonderful synopsis of this really ambitious PVD omics project, where they're essentially going to try to redefine the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension by using very high resolution phenotyping, uh, using all the state of the art measurements that we can possibly make in the clinic. I, I think and I hope that some of these genomic, proteomic, or cell biomic techniques will either directly or indirectly reveal aspects of the BMP signaling pathway, including the BMP9 and BMPR2 signaling that we've discussed, that would help us identify people who could be most likely to benefit from these strategies. Before I close, I want to thank the PHA as a community and as an organization for all that they've done to support and enable our work. We've appreciated this at many levels. Um, most importantly, the inspiration that we receive from the people in this room. This is what drives us. I can say that the PHA has allowed us to accomplish more as a community than we could as individuals. And finally, we're grateful for the generous mentorship that we've received from this entire group. And we look forward to returning the favor. I want to acknowledge the members of my group who've made this work possible, and you've seen many of them, you've met many of them over the years working in the research room, and some of them are here with me today. I want to acknowledge our funding support, especially from the Pulmonary Hypertension Association and all of our incredible collaborators in this community. Thanks again.
Thank you so much, Paul. That was an incredible presentation, and I think I can speak on behalf of the PHA how proud uh, we all are of your accomplishments and your team's accomplishments and, and uh, the many that we look forward to in the future. So thank you again, Paul. So before we conclude this evening, I do have a few house housekeeping announcements um, for you about our programs. Many of our patients, healthcare providers, and other community members have used art as a way to cultivate their creativity, share their experiences, and find hope. For the first time, PHA is hosting an art gallery where these community members can share their hope with all of you. To help support PHA's mission, everyone will be able to purchase raffle tickets to win artwork created by these members of the PH community. Please, everybody, take some time tomorrow to visit and to be inspired by the beautiful artwork that's going to be presented and purchase raffles and tickets just $5 each. Please uh, show your support. The second announcement is uh, throughout this PHA conference, we are all learning about precision medicine and discussing personalization of medicine. Tomorrow, you'll have the opportunity to personalize your own conference experience by meeting global leaders in the pulmonary hypertension field during the networking with a medical professional breakfast. This is a unique opportunity for patients to sit with healthcare providers and leaders in PH and specifically to ask about a variety of topics before attending the day's PHA breakout sessions. So join us back here in Ocean's Ballroom 1 through 8 from 8 to 9 a.m. And I want to say thank you all for attending. It's been a wonderful evening and good night. Thank you.